Welcome to the Known Experience Podcast. I'm John Poitiva and my co-host, Sean Scott, and our guest today, Ethan Stonerook, are joining us from the Wake Forest School of Medicine, where he's an assistant professor, and he teaches relationship-centered communication, personal and professional identity development, and medical humanities. And Ethan, it's so great to have you with us today. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And Sean, uh, again, we have a guest that that you brought to us that you know. So I'll let you uh, open us up a little bit more and tell us why we're talking to Ethan and kind of start our conversation. Ethan and I have, again, met on the pickleball court, which I feel like it sounds to, it, to all the people listening. It sounds like my life is just revolves around pickleball. But um, it's actually where I met the most uh, guys in the area. Um, I was having a hard time meeting people and I found out he worked in the medical field. Like, I don't know, there was, I don't know, a third of the guys seemed to there. Um, and of course, like usual, uh, I kind of wanted to know a little bit more. And Ethan asked about one of our trips that we took and if we did them. And I was like, oh, this guy's kind of interested in it. And he, we actually hadn't talked about what he did on the daily for many weeks um we were just pickleball partners and he's a pretty ferocious competitor and throws his paddle occasionally just like i do uh <laughs> but when he said what he did i had never heard of it right i didn't even know there was such a thing for someone that like him that tries to introduce story and you know he's into poetry and just the whole side of medicine that i didn't think existed right like when i think of school of medicine and men and women choosing to go down that path. I just think of type A, you know, vision focused. They put, they, to get through the 10, 12 years of what it takes to kind of get to the destination, right? Like emotion, just, it's not part of the equation. Um, but then you meet some doctors, right? The one that took care of my mom when she was dying, uh, an incredibly empathetic doctor. Um, and I actually connected with him about that. And, and um, so I guess the point was I I thought it was rare. I ran into guys occasionally that seem to have that turned on, but this is what he does, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it completely aligns with uh, what we're trying to focus on. So my bet is a lot of people didn't know that a guy like Ethan exists to help those in med school and maybe beyond. I'm not sure if you do it with actual you know the doctors that are practicing, mm -hmm. but it's it's good to know, and hopefully it's a growing uh, emphasis in the field. So, yeah. So what Sean said was interesting that you go through this 10 or 12 year journey to get to a destination. And a lot of people find when they get to that destination, it's at a bedside looking at a patient that's suffering and all these faculties you've learned to critically think and solve clinical problems um, are very important, obviously, but you're facing a person that is super unique they carry a story with them that you have very limited access to and caring for them in an empathetic way, forming uh, a therapeutic relationship, a partnership for decision-making is fully dependent on honoring them as a human. And so if you've left all that stuff behind as you've gone through this process, you're not going to do that well. You could know everything in the world about treating cancer, but... Um, how are you going to usher that person into a conversation about death and dying, for example? Hmm. Um, so what I do primarily, my goals at the School of Medicine here are to engage students in narrative in a way that builds habits of noticing in them. So they're looking at a patient, beholding their face, noticing emotion, seeing what family members are doing, hmm. looking at posture, leaving room for silence. And probably more than anything, leaving room for mystery and curiosity and questions internally um, to sort of honor that experience for patients. So one of the ways we do that is we engage in film or poetry or short fiction, and we pick it apart like you would in a film class or a poetry class. Um, so we'll uh, read a poem in class or they'll read a short story before they come, and then we'll spend 45 minutes to an hour picking that apart. You know, what about this did you love? What kind of gut feeling did it give you? 
Um, I'll pull up the emotion wheel, which I'm sure you guys have been exposed to at some point. Um, and, you know, a lot of these folks haven't even considered that some of these are emotions. I had a professor uh -huh. in a meeting recently that I proposed this idea that when you bring up hot topics in class, consider bringing up this emotion wheel. And uh, he looked at the wheel and he said, there aren't this many emotions. There's hunger and anger. <laughs> <laughs> and so I try to engage these things wow. to wake up a part of the, the real human part of these students or not even to wake up. I think it's probably w awoken already, but to foster that as they go through this more didactic, um, really clinically heavy education to foster that other part of them that brought them here at the first place. Yeah, Sean had talked about what you do, but my mind is blown right now. Uh, as someone who spent way too much time in hospitals and with doctors over the last 12 years. Um, so I, I have to ask, how does traditional medical training teach doctors to relate to patients relationally? Yeah, so I think the model changed in the last, I don't know, 50 years, but the historical model was pretty paternalistic or uh, patronizing where typically a male provider or physician would come into the room, tell you what they figured out is wrong with you and tell you the treatment that you need to comply with. And it's changed probably in the last 20 years or so where it is more of a partnership, but I don't think medical school curricula over the last 20 years has changed too much. We've included some things like building common ground and um, reflective listening to some degree, but I think students show up and the material is so hard, like the cognitive load of this material is so much that when the students get to the class where they're learning communication, it's sort of like a one-off. Right, like, right. I know this is important, but I just don't have space in my brain for it right now. Mm -hmm. So I think my primary goal, or I should, not my primary goal, but the starting point for me has to be buy-in, where I have to convince these students that story matters and that communication matters and that feeling listened to and heard and understood has to be the bedrock of really any relationship, but especially a relationship that tends to be hierarchical or somebody has, somebody seems to have the corner on the market of agency and knowledge. And so putting in a foundation of sh shared understanding and feeling understood has to be the bedrock of that. Right. And I think, I think one of you know, John, you, your question was their external training, right? But the external comes after they deal with their internal, right? Everything is, everything is an output. It's, again, from my perspective, it seems like the journey is about the, exter the external knowledge, proving your, your mastery of knowledge, caring for the patient. But one bedside is followed by the next bedside is followed by the next, which is followed by a lawsuit <laughs> or whatever, which is followed by a death. So that external load is extremely high. Um, so how do you, how do you say, Hey, the external stuff? Yeah, it's difficult, but your internal processing, knowing yourself, right. Knowing when you're at a limit of, that needs to be addressed, even in school, right. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they, red line a lot so how do you how do you approach that that's a great question i would say that i see my job as sort of two um, buckets one is how do i train these people to care for patients in a really humanistic way but that has to start with things like self-awareness knowing what your boundaries need to be acknowledging your own emotions i mean to to have a response where you're either hungry or angry and there's no other option um, it's not a healthy space to be in. And that's a faculty member, right? Uh, let alone a 23-year-old who just went through whatever the world just went through over the last eight years, plus COVID, uh, plus this curriculum. So the other bucket being, who am I and who am I becoming? And how do I want to get there? Um, so my approach to that really is uh, sort of a pastoral look at how I enter the classroom, how I make eye contact, the tone that I speak to students in, to create an environment 
that they feel safe and comfortable. Because if you're not in an environment where you feel safe, you're not going to learn. Mm. Um, so I, I see the development of clinicians. It has to be also a development of persons. And so that's probably, you know, I said my starting point was buy-in. I think probably even before that is honoring people as individuals and casting a vision that this next two years or four years or however long you're in school is for you to become the certain type of person you imagine yourself being. So that requires a lot of curiosity and vision work and um, time for reflection and small group and dialogue and things like that. So we start, I guess, there. Yeah. So essentially modeling for them what you hope that they will do for others, right? Like you're, yeah. you're living it out in front of them where they feel it personally. Mm -hmm. um, why, why did this become important to you? How did this become a, a, uh, a passion of your life and something that you want to see spread throughout the medical community? So I think I've always been really interested in stories. I've always been an empath. I remember as a kid, like if I fell off my bike, I wouldn't cry. But if I watched um, mm -hmm. Fox and the Hound, I was a mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's something there inherent in me that, that just has the gene for, uh, I use the gene term loosely, but that inherently wants to care for people and see them um, at a level that they might not be seen by the average Joe. Um, but then when I went into clinical practice, I was taking care of people with leukemia, really difficult blood cancers, and 40 to 60% of them were dying within two years of meeting them. Hmm. And those are like stories I sort of carried with me. I describe it as students as if, you know, when you're a kid and you go on vacation, you might collect a rock here and there. And I would just put these rocks in my pockets and have to do something with them. And what that would be would I just be walking down the street or washing dishes in my kitchen and an image of somebody's face would pop up or a moment that I had with them at the bedside and wonder, like, what the heck am I supposed to do with this? Mm -hmm. And so I started writing their stories down just as a way to memorialize people and to honor my own experience of sort of a moral injury or existential harm that I think happens as you care for people that are dying. And I found some representation in my own stories and was sort of aware of my own experience of suffering alongside people who were suffering. And I think that that experience combined with a baseline empathy, um, and just seeing students who are hurting. They grew up in a world that was different than the world that I think we grew up in. And I just want to not only care for them, but help them have a vision and develop the skills to care for themselves and to build an ecosystem around themselves to care for them. You know, we had, we had previously talked about doctors and how present this is, right, in practice, right? So, so once you get done with a student and they're in practice, is it easy to find doctors that are willing to talk about what they're struggling with to, to like walk into a room and you feel this sense of vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. um, because there's, there's one thing when it's required or it's a class, mm -hmm. right? And you can understand it, but then when you get in life, just is life, right? Unless you're, con unless it's something you're intentional about. Um, are you seeing this in better practice, I guess, with, with doctors? That's a good question. I think, so there's historically a pretty hierarchical structure in medicine and the MO of a clinician's identity is you can't be wrong. Um, you wield quite a bit of power and responsibility. And so showing any vulnerability is um, kind of anathema to the culture. So the my primary students are physician assistant students mm -hmm. who I think there's some selection bias where we get people that are a little bit more well-rounded. I say this loosely, right? This is an overgeneralization, but maybe a little bit more self-aware, a little bit more in tune with who they want to be, what they want their life to look like. And so it's not really hard to get them mm -hmm. on board with this. And then they go out into rotations 
whether they're actually doing patient care at the bedside or I have worked alongside them after they've graduated. And you see that they really are incredibly humanistic caregivers and, and providers. I think that that's probably the case with a lot of people that go to an MD program, you know, and become doctors. And I think that in general, the culture is changing a lot. Uh, and of course, there's going to be baby boomers out there that are terrific at this and young people who are not. But I do think it is beginning to translate more and more and doing that pre-work of helping students understand how important it is to feel known and feel understood has to overflow into wanting to understood and know patients. Right. So I do think that this bleeds over into actual patient care later on. Do do hospitals, again, sorry, I keep, I, I just like to see like the continuing piece, right? Do hospitals have someone on staff that's full-time that's kind of doing in your role, right? Kind of doing physician care. No, that's what I would love to do. Uh, I'm in the infancy of a project with a pediatric surgeon at Duke who wants to do this with surgery residents. So surgery residents are far and away, they have the hardest job in the hospital. Mm. They are constantly saving people's lives or watching people die, and they have a ton on their shoulders. So he has this vision called the Good Surgeon Project that's getting some external funding, a whole bunch of external funding. And the long-term vision is that this would be a program we would bring to like dozens, if not hundreds of medical schools across the country to implement with residents. Now, that's different than implementing it with a 50-year-old that's been in practice for two decades and um, probably has some degree of baseline cynicism at this point. And we're almost all working in large systems now, which brings its own set of challenges and and cultural cynicism that's sort of in the water. Um, I think some big systems are doing some good things. There's something called Schwartz rounds here where once a quarter people will get together and sort of share their difficult stories and people reflect on them. And that's a place that people might feel known where shame can maybe be brought out into the open a little bit. Again, there's like the people that are going to attend that are the people that probably don't need it, need it. <laughs> right. and the people that do need it are, are probably not going to attend. I had started a pilot project with oncology providers, nurses, um, advanced practitioners like myself, PAs and nurse practitioners, and even pharmacists and some other allied health folks came where we were doing narrative medicine, this practice of reading a poem and picking it apart and then writing reflectively afterward. Um, and that was a really cool project, but it wasn't funded. I was just doing it on my own time because I was passionate about it. My vision would be for large systems like this to have something like this at the clinic level, you know, where you're doing it once a month with people, tracking how it's changing them, tracking things like burnout and resilience and um, longevity turnover. Because that what I've seen in students is it really does support their mental health and their processing and sort of decomposing of hard things into some kind of meaning. Even this is all really fascinating to me because I'm, like I said, I've been in a lot of hospitals and doctor's offices in the last decade, but I also have friends that work in this, uh, NP surgery, uh, here in the hospital, like systems in Dallas. Um, but most of us listening to this are not, in the medical field, right? But we still have a need uh, to connect more with ourselves, or with our own stories, with the stories of others. Uh, what are some of the tools you use? You mentioned poetry, writing, uh, even watching videos or movies or things like that. What are some of the tools that you use that that those of us listening to this could really implement ourselves? Yeah, so I read a ton of fiction. And that might sound like not a good starting place for feeling known or processing your junk. But if you really engage really good literary fiction, and I can give you some resources in a second, and then use that to explore who you are, your behaviors, your patterns of behaviors, who you're becoming, um, it's sort of like an ability to look at yourself outside yourself. So there's a really good short story by George Saunders, who's my favorite fiction writer. He teaches at Syracuse. Uh, the story is called The Falls, and it's two, two protagonists. One is 
sort of a loner in town, a guy that's in his middle age, uh, unmarried, walking down a road. And then the other is this guy who's, who's basically me. He's a dad, kind of washed up, <laughs> thinks about his glory days, thinks about conflict with his wife and all the accoutrements of difficulty that come with running a household. Um, he's got a paunch gut, like all the things that we wish we had not become and we sort of reflect on. And so as you're reading this guy's character, or at least when I'm reading this guy's character, I'm like, gosh, this is kind of cringy. He's reminding me a little bit of myself. And then they they both get a chance to see each other and they sort of do this internal dialogue, monologue or judging of the other person. Um, and then they both notice these two girls in a canoe going down <clears throat> this stream toward the waterfall. And they both react in two different ways. And I'm not going to give it away because I really it's a really short read. Um, but by the end of the story, you've had a chance to really reflect on the kind of guy you are. And my dream, uh, I have a ton of dreams. One thing I would love to do is sit down with a group of six or eight other men, read this story, and talk about it for like 45 minutes. Hmm. And we'd talk about all the things we're insecure about, the things we wished had happened that hadn't the things that happened that we wish hadn't happened. And in the end, we have a writing prompt. So for five minutes, you write reflectively. I don't, off the cuff, I would say, write about a time somebody needed your help. And then you write about it, not judging your writing, not worried about punctuation or spelling for five minutes. And at the end of five minutes, people share what they've written and people reflect on what they've written. And by the end, you're like, holy smokes, I didn't know that was inside me. Now it's on paper and I can look at it physically. My friend Sean can look at it physically and notice things in the story or in my writing that I didn't even notice. And by the end of it, this magical thing that's very non-scientific happens where it's like, oh, this sort of trope I made out of myself, the story I'm telling myself at the age of 40, I have four kids, a wife, full-time job, 25 handicap. <laughs> um the story I'm telling myself about myself isn't is a little oversimplified. Like yeah. maybe I'm more of a complex character than I think, mm. and maybe deserve a little bit more grace or accountability for that matter. Right. So that's one way I think I've developed a little bit as a middle-aged man is engaging in sort of self-awareness or self-analysis through some other third-party material, whether it's a piece of fiction or poetry or film. You know, pickleball even plays that to some degree. Like Sean said, I throw paddles every now and then. And I have to reflect: Am I still the twelve-year-old that uh, <laughs> punched some kid in the good game line? Kind of. Well, Ethan, that exercise is something we will absolutely let you do. We'll we'll bring you on the next known adventure, and uh, we'll do that sitting uh, in Montana, uh, overlooking the mountains. That sounds like a good uh, good setting for that. John Eldridge says, sometimes you only understand your own story when you hear it told by someone else. And mm -hmm. I think it's that same experience. And and we'll put other um, suggested reading that you have in the show notes here. Um, any other exercises that you'd you'd recommend for us? I think that one's fantastic. I mean, that would I'm going to yeah. do that this week. <laughs> Let me think about other exercises. I mean, I think just guided conversations right. in general are really helpful. Uh, most of us grew up in a culture that's like, what does masculinity look like? And I, I grew up in the eighties and nineties. What do I carry into the 2020s as far as what masculinity looks like or fatherhood looks like, or being a husband? Um, so having somebody ask me good questions, I think is really important. Doing things like listening to podcasts like this or being on a podcast like this is really important. But I, I talked earlier about buy-in. So when Sean and I show up to pickleball, we bring a certain expectation of other people. Like, I don't want this just to be a conversation about the playoffs. I would love to find out who you are, what makes you tick. Why are you still in your marriage? Why do you still coach your kids' little league team? Or why are you depressed right now? Could we have a conversation about that? So the buy-in part is how vulnerable are we willing to be with each other? And that can be really dangerous and feel unsafe, depending on what our experiences have been. 
and in what context we had those experiences. So were you in a toxic church environment or high school baseball team uh, where vulnerability was a liability versus live, or excuse me, vulnerability can also build connection and trust and growth. So how do we bring ourselves to whatever environments we're in to help recruit our own vulnerability and courage and recruit that from other people? So I'm not answering your question in a concrete way, but mm -hmm. um, sort of a spirit of being in a commitment to ourselves going into a situation like, all right, my two commitments are going to listen and I'm going to find a place to be vulnerable or I'm going to reflect back what somebody said to me and look for a place that we could unpack something that sounds important yeah hmm. i mean i i do think you're answering it in a, in a concrete way in that it's is we're bringing mindfulness to everything that we do it's it's mm -hmm. not a compartmentalized thing of like personal reflection off when you have time for it it's going into a meeting at work it's going to pickleball it's wherever you are at the gym right like mm -hmm. am i aware of the people around me am i um interested in their lives beyond just what we're here to do that's right yeah well and and when you practice that right you can slip in into that much easier mm -hmm. right so when you first start it's kind of like we're setting a time and place this is what we're doing right like this is the objective <laughs> right when you go to counseling that's what you're there for mm -hmm. right and no one really knows and but when you start practice practicing that and i think what i've shared to Ethan and a couple other guys, even with pickleball, right? For me, being the newer guy in a town where I feel like everyone knows each other and has for 20 years, right? Where you just, it's like hard. And they're at a stage in life where they where they have families, right? So, so we're not 22 year old guys that can hang out all weekend, all the time. We have very limited time. And I know that. So, but I've practiced, it's always on my mind. Like, hey, I love playing with Ethan. He's a good athlete. I saw a guy that had had practiced it, right? And that's probably why I slipped into it right after pickleball. There wasn't, there was no, okay, this is sharing time. Right. It was like, I was thinking about it and I wanted to talk about it. And he was immediately tuned in, right? But it's mm -hmm. because he practices it. And I think that's what I, whether it's medical students or other men, is initially it is awkward mm -hmm. and it feels like this additional class mm -hmm. or an additional task that you're not really bought into. Mm -hmm. But then when you start seeing um, the benefits, when you make that disciplined decision to show up in that manner, it's it becomes not an uncomfortable um, way of uh, of being. You it makes pickleball more meaningful, right? Right, like so I can wrap the night and have a really great conversation, and it's not just me being my thirteen year old competitive self, like. Yeah, the man, father, the the athlete. You, when you can have three hours and it, it's all packed into that, then I'm like, wow, I really want to show up here every week, right? right. And it doesn't have to be a big deal, right? Right. We're not like right. having a powwow. <laughs> right. We are just having conversation that waxes and wanes right. in and out of intentionality. Right. Um, that can span the spectrum of talking about the playoffs or having banter to much more serious things. And you said ways of being, I think developing habits of being and, and speaking is, is everything, but you do have to start out with this more mechanical thing. Um, earlier before we recording, I shared this quote from Warren Kinghorn who teaches and works at Duke as a psychiatrist and in the divinity school, he says, we're not machines to be solved, but wayfarers to be attended to. Um, and I think a lot of us feel like machines to be solved mm. and through relationship and these habits of communication, we can honor our own experience and the experience of others by recognizing that we are sort of all on a road to recovery from whatever we grew up in, whatever we've uh, sort of put in our backpack along the way. Yeah. Is there, is there a story that you have, and obviously it's, it's a medical field, so nothing can be specific, but where where you saw or one of your former students or a colleague told you about a moment that was really special, right? Where that, this moment with a, a um, it could be just a colleague, it doesn't have to be a patient, but where that human side was 
it was profound and that stuck with them, right? Do you, do you have any? Yeah, I can think of two stories come to mind right off the bat. I'll tell, I'll tell one of them. So this was probably eight years ago. I was caring for a man who was late in life, had leukemia, and he had relapsed. So his leukemia had come back after a transplant. And I was doing a bone marrow biopsy on him. And if it was positive for leukemia, he was going to go home with hospice. He was in the hospital. And if it was negative, he was going to get more um, immunosuppression, you know, continue the long road of recovery versus not recovery. Um, and he was in his late seventies at this point, <clears throat> he had, he was German and his father had been a Nazi tank mechanic in the, in like 1943. And I'm a person of faith. I don't bring that up often. I try to keep my cards close on that because I, people can make assumptions and I want to love people for who they are and earn their trust legitimately and not for some kind of bait, bait and switch. But um, he's face down on a procedure table and I've got sterile gloves on, needle in my hands. And he turns around and in this like beautiful German accent, he says, do you pray? And I said, yeah, I pray. Do you want me to pray for you? And he said, I do, but not out loud. And so I just sort of silently prayed for 20 or 30 seconds. And then we did the bone marrow biopsy. Um, he had leukemia and it had come back. And so that was, I think two days later, discharged into home with hospice and didn't talk to him again. Um, but I was reflecting on who is this guy? He comes to the U S sometime in like the eighties or nineties. I think it was after, uh, the Berlin wall fell. So early nineties. And the world he is born into is atheistic and just totally different framework for being than the world I grew up in. And we had this moment that was really less about me praying for him or asking me to pray for him, but we had built enough trust that he comes out of that world. Oh, and he, I forgot to tell you this part. He said, I've never heard somebody pray out loud before. And he was almost scared to hear it, which is wow. why he asked me to do it wow. silently. I thought like, boy, this is a moment that if somebody ever writes a biography about me, this belongs in it. Yeah, uh, Just a, a huge moment for seeing the humanity in another person and honoring it for what it was. Like he doesn't have to believe what I believe, but he has a similar hope that I have for him um, and a similar despair at the same time. Um and I, there's a moment like that every week in a hospital that providers have. Last week, a woman that was intubated in the ICU but awake um, was trying to communicate something she needed. It was like stuck behind her endotracheal tube, this, this cry or petition, and realized it was water, the one thing I couldn't give her because she was intubated. And it was a powerless moment for me as a provider. You know, we all come to, into medicine hoping to solve problems, and I couldn't couldn't solve this one problem. And one option are these stupid pink sponges on the end of a plastic stick. It's like a lollipop, but it's a sponge. You can dip in water and wet their palate, which is an insult compared to offering somebody a glass of, like, refreshing water. And so all I could do is make eye contact with her, put my hand on her shoulder, tell her I was sorry. And we just had this pretty beautiful but awful moment of eye contact and human exchange without me solving her problem. Mm -hmm. um, those are the stones that we kind of carry with us around the hospital and when we go home. And one option is to sort of avoid them or harden our hearts toward things. And I think that that leads to more cynicism than if we engage them to a healthy and appropriate degree bring them out into the light for the people that care about us to see and speak to, and then make some semblance of meaning out of the hard things we experience. Mm. Mm. Man, there's something that you, you hit on there that we talked about before we started recording that I'd really like to hear you talk more about. And, and it, it uh, also, it, it stems from that quote that you shared, those experience that you just talked about you and I and Sean come from a, a faith background that um, 
there's kind of this sometimes overtly taught and sometimes it's just understood that that our our job our responsibility is to fix people's existential dread mm. uh and um i found that that it prevented me from humanizing people from mm. really connecting with people and really loving them well um what's that journey been like for you from coming from that kind of mindset to this very different experience that you're having and helping other mm-hmm. people have now. Yeah. So the, the pressure's off. Um, I remember the first time my dad found out I smoked weed in high school, the conversation was about how I blew my witness that these people were not going to come to faith because of me choosing to do this very childish behavior as a 16 year old or something like that. That's a ton of pressure to put on an adolescent versus could I just love this guy, this German guy for who he is and not white knuckle it or sweat what his existential beliefs are. That's not really my responsibility. Um, I, I think my responsibility is to be with people, which actually is an affirmation of the faith that I grew up in and still have is that I'm only called to be alongside somebody. Um, there's a, at the risk of being very pretentious, I'll quote a poem that I've been mulling over in my mind by George Herbert. It's called The Christian Plummet. It says, down into the cold, icy depths you've plunged. Um, no, I can't do it. We're going to have to edit this part out. Okay. Um, do you want to pull it up? I've got it here. Yeah. 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 But you still need to say at the risk of being pretentious. That was that was. Yeah, my favorite part. <laughs> yeah. All right. So it reminds me of this poem that I've kind of been mulling over. And at the risk of being pretentious, I'm going to share it. It's called The Christian Plummet by George Herbert. Down into the icy depths you plunge, the cold, dark undertow of your depression. Even your memories of light made strange as you fall further from all comprehension. You feel as though they've thrown you overboard your fellow Christians on the sunlit deck, a stone-cold Jonah on whom scorn is poured, a sacrifice to save them from the wreck. But someone has their hands on your long line. You sound for them the depths they sail above. One who takes Jonah as their only sign sinks lower still to wrap you in his love. And though you cannot see or speak or breathe, the everlasting arms are underneath. Nothing in that poem speaks to um, convincing somebody's metaphysical worldview of something. (laughs) It's just bearing the weight with them. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all is for me, whether it's my wife, my children, students, patients, you guys, somebody I meet on the pickleball court. Um, how can we be together in your joy and in your suffering so that you're not alone? It's the most privileged place you can be on earth, no matter who the person is. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'll tell you what, I, I actually neglected to prep for this podcast. Like I do others. (laughs) And Ethan texted me yesterday, like, kind of like, Hey, so what are we talking about? Um, but like much of my life, I feel like when I'm not prepared, <laughs> but when I know um, who the person is that's showing up, right, uh, a really beautiful thing can happen. And I think today, having it be completely unscripted, I, I, like there was not a question I had written down coming into this, right? It was, <laughs> I was unprepared. Um, but uh, Ethan has really uh, giving, given me uh, more to think about and has opened up kind of our eyes to what's happening behind the scenes um, with these young people that are kind of wandering into the depths of mm. what it means to care for others. And um, and I think ending <laughs> on this, uh, at this spot after you read that is, uh, is, is appropriate. Um, so, man, John, that was that was a good one. We're gonna have a lot to talk to you, talk about in the uh, in the after show portion. But um, 
Really appreciate it, man. I'm not going to give people, he, he's not a social media guy, so we're not going to give you um, his socials and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if, if you have um, any way that people can contact you. Um, yeah, you can contact me through LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on the Wake Forest School of Medicine website where I think my email is posted um, and you can send me an email. I'm very open, happy to engage, um, trying to grow in my professional development in these areas. Some, I think this is something that um, I'd love to see happen other places, um, other schools of medicine and even outside of medicine. So thanks for having me guys. It's been great. Well, when, when Sean and I started doing this podcast, when we were talking about it, um, we really lowered the bar as far as our goals to be one uh, to grow as friends and two mm -hmm. to grow in this area that we care about. And if other people benefit from that, that's great. And I just know for me, that's happened today. And I know for Sean, that's happened too. And uh, just thank you for spending time with us and hope you can join us on one of these trips. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people would be um, just encouraged and, and just uh, helped by that. So thank you again, Ethan. And uh, for Sean, uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, once again, we hope that you will experience the power of being known. Welcome back to After the Interview. Uh, this is where we just take a few minutes and talk about the conversation and, and what stood out to us. And uh, Sean, uh, if you want to go first, you can. I've got a lot of stuff that that this stirred in me that I've been thinking about. No, I, th I think you should because um, uh, I, I tend to be the guy that likes listening. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Let me talk about that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, go ahead, man. Well, the first thing that you really, uh, we both kind of picked up on is, is how is this different than traditional medicine or traditional medical training? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you've, you've spent some time, you know, uh, dealing with your mom and other situations. And, and as you know, I have too. And um, I think he was actually pretty kind to tra traditional medical training. I, I know he chose his words very carefully, <laughs> but from my understanding, and I'm not a professional like him, that traditional medical training very much intentionally tells uh, doctors, physicians, nurses, surgeons to remain detached from the patient um, relationally and emotionally. And yeah. uh, just a little evidence on this is if you go back and you think about the stereotypical uh, psychiatrist couch, you know, that's always used in uh, movies and things like that, where, where the person lays on the couch facing away from the psychiatrist, Yeah, you know, that, that philosophy was that they didn't even want the patient looking at them because they didn't want it to affect them yeah. uh, in their role of serving this person. So I, I really do think that's where we're coming from to a place of someone like Ethan teaching uh nurses and doctors how to make eye contact how to read body language how to i love that he said how to be comfortable with the the silence yeah i think that's huge and then what to do with the stones mm. right I, I think that was just one of the things i i've always wondered that is no matter how cold they are they're still human and so every person that passes or quote unquote failure that they have it's a stone that they carry you know and you know, i think he said he was washing dishes and one yeah. of those stones just came back yeah. um and how how they deal with that so, which is so important right yeah. I, they're great at what they do they may be trained to kind of disassociate from the person because they carry so many stones but they still have them so yeah that was a, that was cool but yeah how do they um yeah, how do they also, I mean, how do they let those things go in some way, but also how do they not become so numb to it right. that it doesn't bother them? I, I, um, I have a friend that was that was a therapist years ago, and they said that there's a stop sign near their home. And because uh, I asked them, like, how do you sit through this? Hours and hours. I was right. working in an alcohol and drug treatment facility at the time. I was like, hey. hey I was hearing stories that were just so crazy and horrible that if you made a movie out of it, people wouldn't believe you. They would right. think this is crazy. 
And I said, how do you do it? And they said, well, there's a stop sign near my home. And when I pull up to that stop sign, I pull over to the side and I turn my car off. And just for about two minutes, I just decide I'm going to leave everything that I went through today right here. Hmm. And it's important and I'll pick it up later, but I need to be present with my family and I need to just let this go. And I thought that was, they had a practice that right. helped them do that. It sounds like he's, he's helping give them some practices as well. Uh, the, the other thing that really stood out to me was this quote from Dr. Warren Kinghorn. Uh, he said, uh, and I think Ethan got it a little bit, uh, got one word off, but because I went and looked at it, looked him up later. Uh, he says, we're not machines to be fixed, but wayfarers to be attended. And uh, I've I've thought of those ideas in different ways, but the language there really connected with me. Yeah, well, especially coming from, you know, if you came from a background like we have, um, you realize that there's you view yourself as someone that's broken and needs to be fixed first right and it's this constant state of oh what else is broken in me that needs to be fixed and it's not it's it um it affects again if you're a person of faith right it, it affects just how you value yourself um and how much you care to attend to the person of you right mm -hmm. instead of just this fragmented individual that has a lot wrong with them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was taught to me or for its personality or whatever, but it seemed like in my faith journey, like it, the, the whole focus of it was what's God working on in your life right now, which basically means how are you messed up that needs to be fixed? Right. And it, that was like the hyper focus of, of the relationship was, okay, what do we need to work on today? What's wrong with me today? What? And... and that was framed in humility, right? I think that's like the weird part about it. It was, it was like you almost embraced that dialogue because then you were humble. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it, uh, I still struggle with that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I still have residue of it. I still have to. And like I said, maybe some of it's personality. Um, but uh, I think also then we transfer that to other people. So what's wrong with them that needs to be fixed? Or right. how do I need to help them? Or um, And then people become projects. And right. it's like, I'm a project. The people around me are projects. Instead of we are wayfarers that need to be attended mm. to. Um, you know, I didn't grow up Catholic, but I've, I've gained a lot of Catholic friends in the last uh, six, seven years through my work. And Catholics use this word accompaniment. And accompaniment is is going on the journey of life with another person. And uh, Pope Francis uh, frames it this way. He says, the art of accompaniment, I'm going to get this wrong, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. The art of accompaniment means taking off your shoes on the holy ground of another person's life. Mm. Now, that's way different than I'm here to fix you, right? <laughs> right, right. That's right. That's like, I'm here to journey with you. And the fact that you're letting me into your space is sacred. Mm. And I need to honor that before I do anything else. Mm. And uh, that that just that's something I want to carry with me more every day in my relationships with other people. Yeah. And and my relationship with myself. Good. All right. What what else stood out to you, Sean? No, keep going, man. This is good. <laughs> this is good. I got a whole list. Yeah. Well, uh, the 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 um story uh the falls by george saunders i loved how he talked about like reading a fiction story with others and then journaling it so you have an artifact from this to to go back and look at later and you even reading your own words causes you to process them differently right right and um and so i read that story last night uh after we did our interview uh and and it reminded me of a story by flannery o'connor and I encourage you, uh, if you're listening to this, go look up The Falls by George Saunders. It's a short story. It'll take you like, well, if it's me, it'll take you half an hour. It'll probably take you like five <laughs> minutes to read. Um, but um, The Turkey is this story by Flannery O'Connor. And it's about this little boy named Roller. And Roller is kind of the runt in his family, which I could really relate to. <laughs> My siblings are all 10 to 15 years older than me. And, uh, and he spends a lot of time alone, which I could relate to as a child. I spent a lot of time alone because of that. 
And his family kind of thinks he's odd because he spends so much time alone, which I could relate to that as well. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, Roller, uh, he decides for Thanksgiving, he's going to go shoot a turkey and bring it home. And finally, everybody will think that he's, you know, he's worthy, right? He's the, he's, man, yeah. he's the man. He's done something. He's not like the little, he's not the baby of the family anymore. He's not the runt. He's finally stepped up and done something that contributes to the family. And he goes out and he he prays like, God, help me find a turkey. And he can't find a turkey. And he's like, God, why why won't you give me a turkey? Why don't why don't you love me? Right. And uh, and then he finally finds a turkey and he says, God, thank you for giving me this turkey. Like this is this is it. Thank you. You did. You know, you answered my prayer. And then the turkey runs away. <laughs> and he, he's like god why why'd you let the tur- why'd you give me the turkey just to let it run away yeah. and then he finally keeps walking and walking and he finds the turkey again he's like thank you god thank you for giving me the turkey and then he shoots the turkey but he misses and the turkey runs off and he thinks god why'd you do that and then i miss like that's not fair and then he finds the he, he finds some blood on the ground and realizes i did hit the turkey oh my gosh and he tracks it and he finds the turkey and he says Thank you, God, for giving me the turkey. And he's so excited. He puts it over his shoulders and he starts walking home. And he's just walking on a cloud. He's like, I got the turkey. Thank you, God. I'm going to be worthy. I'm going to be, you know, significant now. And on the way home, he sees these boys that uh, used to pick on him in school. And he thinks, man, I'm going to show them I got a turkey. Now they're going to think I'm the man as well. And he walks up to them and they say, hey, uh, Look, I, I, he says, I, I got a turkey. Look at this. And they go, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Can we see it? And he, he holds it out and they grab his turkey and they run away with it. And that's the end of the story. That's it. <laughs> but, you know, when he said that fiction helps him with and, and his students with self-awareness and really uh, recognizing things as self-discovery, you know, uh, at first I was like, really fiction? And then I remembered that story and I thought, ah, oh, that story in that story, I saw myself, like how often do I judge my worthiness by others? How often do I judge whether life is going well based on like temporary circumstances? Yeah. And it kind of reminds me of that story of the Chinese farmer, right? Yeah. With the sun, uh, right. which I think enough people have told that story. Google the story of the Chinese farmer. But right, does that story did that story resonate with you like that? Oh yeah, no, I, that that was uh, I, I think I was late to that story. The first time mm-hmm. I read it was uh, two years ago, I think, and it was because of Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> he posted it, but yeah, um, there was there. You know, I I think what Ethan is trying to do to in that world, you know, he talked about poetry a lot. Um, He's somewhat of a trailblazer mm. um, because I don't think it's as common as, um, you know, maybe you'd think it would be, you know, a focused effort, right? There may be seminars, or mm. how, you know, self-care seminars or how to be a better doctor. But what he's really doing and maybe how medicine is shifting Um I mean, when you start introducing story, poetry, reflection, you know, the art into it, it can only make doctors better, you know, PAs better. Yeah. The experience um, for people in moments of crisis that are scared, you know, that, that was just an amazing thing too is, yeah, when he just talked about being there, the power of just, you know, that moment, um, not fixing it not giving them a false assurance that they couldn't back up but just the moments that we share that could be full of bad news but they you know to show up and it may just be silence or silent prayer um that'll change medicine yeah you know it really will i'm excited for him because he's passionate about it right and i like what he wants to do I, I love finding people that don't just have, you know, this, this golden egg idea and they just want to cash in on it for Ethan, you know, like he knows the world he's, he's in it, that world, but he just wants to do it because he just really loves people. He wants to see them succeed and 
thrive personally and create environments. So I love guys like him um, doing it for all the right reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think you're right. Like, I think it is the future, but it's definitely not the present yet. Like right. when you, you said, you know, do hospitals have someone like this? And he said, well, that's my dream. Right. You know, it's that they would. And, um, you know, again, based on my experience, like in alcohol and drug treatment, it's, it's really hard to get uh, entities to invest money in things that are not immediately billable to insurance. Right. Intangibles. And right. You can't, you know, where do you budget self care and, and physician care, nurse care. But I can tell you this, uh, based on the nursing crisis we've had over the last three years. Right, right. Um, I think it's woken some people up that, like, if we're going to retain our um, employees, uh, then we've got to do something better to care for them because it's costing us a fortune to continually right. replace them and to be understaffed. Right. So I think that's that's where disruption, you know, creates innovation. And yes. hopefully that'll happen here. Yeah, yep. Yeah, this will be a great one to share with a lot of the people I know in the medical field. So, well, yeah, I mean, buddy? if you're listening to this and you're, you know, you, you most likely don't work in that field, I encourage you to share it with people uh, who do, because as I've done a little more research uh, on Ethan and Dr. Warren Kinghorn, uh, there's a ton of stuff out there. We're going to put it in the show notes where you can yeah. direct those people. Uh, where they can get more resources for help for things like this. So share it with your friends that work in the medical community. Yeah. Well, guys, we appreciate you um, for joining us. Uh, as always, uh, if if you do love the content you've heard in our short history, please like and share with ones you love. Um, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, but as you go into the, the week, we hope you continue experiencing the power of being known uh, until next time john have a great week see you guys